Grab your Bibles. Um, we're going to jump into the Word this morning. Uh, we started last week. We were talking last week, and uh, we were talking about prayer, and we talked about how we need to connect to God. More than ever in the world we live in, we need to be connected to God. He is our source of everything. He's our provider. He gives us strength. He gives us hope. He gives us help, whatever it is, and we have to stay connected. You know, if I have a, um, a cord that I need to plug into the outlet, it can be all around the outlet, but if it's not plugged into it, there's no power flowing through it, right? You can be, all, you can be close to it. You can sit next to the outlet all day holding the cord, but you're never going to see the power or, or experience the power unless you plug it into the source of power. We have to be connected to God to be able to, to show and live out the life that he has for us. Um, so we have to stay connected. So we talked about last week, there were two things that we needed to do. One was connect, and we talked about it last week, and that's prayer. This week we're talking about disconnecting. And not from God, but from the world around us. Because we have put so much, um, we have so many distractions, and Matt talked about that this morning. We have so many distractions. We have so many things that, that buy for our time. And we have to be careful that we don't get caught up in it, okay? And, and I know some of it can be good at times, but it can also be a distraction. And sometimes for us to connect to something, we have to disconnect from something. If you want to say yes to, you know, if you have different plans or different options to go do things, if you say yes to one, it probably means you're going to have to say no to something else, all right? So for us, if we're going to connect to God, then we're going to have to say, hey, I need to disconnect from this. So let's talk a little bit about that. Go to Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to start reading in verse 5. So we're talking about disconnecting, and I'm really talking about one of the areas I'm talking about is fasting. Now I'm going to tell you something about fasting. I know there's a lot of, you know, people do a lot of different kind of fast. Um, you know, they'll fast social media, different stuff like that. But but scripturally, fasting is not go, is going without food. Um and, uh, but I do think that sometimes it's good to fast or not do social media and other things too. But it's disconnecting. And I want to make this very clear. Fasting does not get God to do more. Just so you know. God's not like, I don't want to help you. Here, do a little bit more before I help you. Fat, what fasting does, it gets our flesh out of the way. Fasting does more to get us in a in a place of being able to receive what God is doing and what he has done. Uh, it's not, it doesn't move God. God's already moving. God already has great things for us. Sometimes it's our flesh that gets in the way and, and messes things up. So we're talking about fasting. I want to read uh, Matthew 6, and he starts talking about prayer, and he says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward that they will ever get. But when you pray, let me say something real quick on that last verse. You can keep it right here. But on that last verse, I'm telling you, just doing things publicly to look the part will get you nowhere. It's really, it's not, listen, it's not what happens in here. Okay, it's, it should be a little bit easier to worship in here because everyone is, right? So sometimes... How many of you have been guilty, be honest, of your Sunday morning good church face that doesn't look the same on Monday morning? Anyone ever been guilty of that? Where you come to church and you're like, oh, bless God. Hey, pastor, great to see you. How are you doing? Oh, just blessed, blessed, blessed. And then Monday morning, you are not talking like that. Because you're back in the real world. You're back to just... Doing what you want to do, you're frustrated, going to the office all grumpy, treating people bad, right? Or we come in here and we're like, yes, we need to pray, we need to seek God. Then you don't talk to him the rest of the week. We all can get that way if we're not careful because here, that's what this is for. But when it comes to really seeking God, I'm telling you where, where you're really going to see the maturity of your personal life is Monday through Saturday, and on Sunday too, but I mean, when you're not in a place where everyone's doing it, 
and now you got work going, you got the kids, get the kids off to school, and you got to do this, and you got to do this. Do you make time? Do you decide, hey, or is it just a, uh, in front of people, this is my thing? Because there are people that, that church is their one time to be spiritual. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's any of y'all. I'm just saying there are people like that. There are people that it's, the church is just, it makes them feel better about themselves. Yes, I went to church. It's amazing as a pastor. I used to play a lot of softball, and I'd play on these different teams for tournaments. And I remember one time I was on a team, and there was no Christians on the team. I could pretty much tell you right away. Um, I could observe that. Um, if you know what I mean. So we're playing in this tournament, and it gets heated, and a couple of times people are threatening to beat up the other person. I mean, there's just like out on the field, people are yelling and telling the umpire, I'll meet you in the parking lot, I'll kick your little whatever. And, and there's all kinds of just, I was like, man, these people are crazy. But in, I would I'd always hear this statement when they would say, Jenkins, man, where do you work? When they asked me, I knew. I was like, man, you, you don't want to know where I work. Like, where do you work? I said, actually, I'm, pa- I'm a pastor. Oh, man, man. I mean, I go to church. I'm a, I'm, I'm a deacon. And I was like, brother, we need to talk to your church. <laughs> well, I just do me a favor. Don't wear any church shirts out here because you might not want to advertise where you go. Um, but And I know people are on a journey and people could get saved and still have stuff they're dealing with. We all do. So I'm not judging that. I'm just saying overall, there's some people that church is just, it's their, it's their way they can feel good about themselves. But there's not a relationship. And I want us to make sure that we're not, we don't ever get caught up in performance or trying to, on the outward, look like something that's not happening inward. Let's look inward today and say, you know what, I don't want to just pray and have this thing where I'm talking this great talk, but I want it to be deep inside of me. That what I say is coming from what is within. You don't say it to try to get that to change inside. It's inside and it flows out. And that's how we should look at it. So anyway, it says when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, pray to your father in private. Then your father who sees everything will reward you. But when you pray, don't babble on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Anybody know any of those? Those people that pray over the meal and like, okay, you have blessed the entire world, all the animals, the food is cold, amen, let's go. Um, Don't be like them, for your father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need. And forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. And if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. Now look at this next verse, because we're talking, it talked about prayer at the beginning, right? And now it says, and when you fast, in other words, fasting is something that we should do. Because he's saying, when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do, for they try to look miserable and disheveled so people will admire them for their fat fasting. I tell you the truth, that is the only reward they will ever get. Goes back to what he said in, 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 at the beginning when he said, don't be like the people that pray. They pray real loud, try to get everybody to hear them, but that's all the reward they'll get. And then he's saying here, you know, when you fast, don't make it so obvious and you're trying to please everyone. Oh, look at me. I'm such a great person. I'm fasting. Oh, yeah, I just haven't eaten in 30 days. I've been seeking God. <sighs> you know, it's like don't, don't do that. He goes on to say, comb your hair, wash your face. Like just be normal. This fasting thing is something between you and God. It doesn't mean if someone knows you're fasting or if you do a, if we did a fast as a church, that's not necessarily bad. But if you're fasting to prove something to people, then you're doing it wrong. Because it's not about you getting any credit. It's actually about getting you away from trying to get credit. It's actually trying to get you to step away from your desires 
to focus on his. So that's where it talks about fasting. <laughs> John 17, 14 through 16. It says this. I've given them your word, and the, and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. So this is where they're talking about, Jesus is saying in this, in this time where he's praying. He's like, they don't belong to the world, but I'm not saying take them out of the world. In other words, they're in the world. They're not of the world. You've heard that said a lot. Be in the world, not of the world. So we can, you can live in the world and not be of it, right? You know, this past uh, uh, Friday, um, my wife and I went fishing. And um, when you, so when you're out on a boat, you can be in miles and miles and miles of water, and there's no problem. If that water starts getting in the boat, you have a problem. So you can live in a world full of junk and stuff and sin and all that stuff. And you can still be fine if you don't let that stuff get in. That's what it means by, not, by being in the world, not being of it. It means you're, you can be around it, but it's not who you are. It doesn't affect you. Because you're, because you're different. And you're not, we're not going to let that stuff creep in. Does it try? Yes. Are we still human? Yes. But when we are aware of things, then we need to let the Lord help us to, to clean that stuff out. And to get that stuff out of our life. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Again, we're talking about disconnecting from the world. So, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. Because of all that he has done for you. Let them be a living, holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is really how to worship him. By giving your bodies to him. That's how you worship him. Don't copy the pattern, the behavior and customs of the world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. Part of us growing and understanding God's ways for us comes when we will really focus on presenting our life, our bodies to him and allowing God to change the way we think. How do we do that? We got to disconnect from all the stuff that's filling our mind. Because there's a lot, I'll, I'll tell you this, and again, it's because of where we're at, but there is so much information out there and there are so many people making decisions on information that they read on any article, on any website, on anyone's Instagram or Facebook, and they take it all as doctrine, and they just hook, line, and sinker, buy into it, and make all kinds of decisions. Based on what so-and-so told me, so I'm not, I, you know, and I mean, it's, that's how it all works. We're so quick to hear something, and then we start thinking, okay, it must be this way, so I need to do this, and we start thinking this, and we start thinking this, and we r really need God to help us to not be so caught up in the stuff of the world. But let him change our mind. Let him give us the thoughts. Let him change how we think. Because then we'll know. We'll know what decisions to make. John 18, 36. Jesus says, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. Says Jesus answered, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers were fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. So the kingdom of God is not of this world. It's not about the things of the world. So if we're going to really focus on connecting with God, we have to start realizing the importance of disconnecting from the world. Because that's not the kingdom of God. It's not the kingdom of God. is not about what we eat or drink or anything. It's about living a life of joy and peace in the Holy Spirit. That's what it's about. And that's where we should put our focus again, is shifting our focus from this stuff that so bombards us. Okay, and don't raise your hands or don't, you don't have to comment, um, you don't have to send in a chat or anything. But let me ask you this, how many of you are on your phone, not for a phone call, but you're on your phone every day? 
most all of us would raise our hands. How many of you are on Facebook or Instagram or whatever other stuff there is, Snapchat, um, I don't know what else there is, but all those, how many of you are on that at least once a day? Most everybody. There's so much out there that gets our attention. There's so much out there that gets our attention. Yet we're finding that, here's what happens, the more you do that, the more you start needing that, the more that starts filling a place in your life to where you're kind of hooked on that. And it's amazing to me because I'm sitting here, one, I was sitting there a while back and I was, I was on Facebook and I'm scrolling through my news feed and I thought, none of this is helpful. Like, I did not, I did not finish that going down my news feed and thinking, whew, praise the Lord, I read that today. I was like, first of all, I don't care what you had for breakfast. And if you posted something on breakfast, it, it wasn't you. Just, I'm just making jokes, all right? I'm just kind of being generic here. But I, I don't care what your opinion is on the vaccination or mask or the world. I really, I really don't. I love you, but, but your opinion doesn't matter to me. I have, and, and I have made decisions for this church based on what I feel the Lord has led me to do to keep people safe and healthy. And I knew going into it that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tick some people off. And can I just tell you, I have succeeded at that. Unintentionally, but I have succeeded. But I have no regrets. And when I see people's opinions and I see people's stuff, I think that's okay. I had a phone call this week of someone asking me my opinion just as a person and I gave it to them and they didn't like it and I was like isn't that amazing you asked me my opinion like you asked me what do you think I'm only telling you what I think because you asked me and then they're upset but here's the thing we, we put all this stuff out there, and we have all these ideas. And you're finding that probably most of you would agree that most of the time you spend in social media does not uplift you. Yet we're, we're so sucked into it. I mean, I, listen, I'm not that old. Well, to some of you, maybe I am, but I'm, I'm 49. But I remember growing up without one of these. I do. I remember that my, my parents didn't have one. They weren't even out then. And guess what? They were okay. They weren't like, yeah, but if something happens, they got to be able to get a hold of me. They said, they, they can get a hold of you. Because stuff happened when I was a kid. Listen, when I get in trouble, they find a way to call my mom and my dad. And if they didn't get a hold of them, then they would leave a message. And then my dad and mom would call back and say, yeah, yeah, we'll come get him. When the school would say he needs to leave, we were suspending your child, they would come get me. And they would take me home. Man, I got suspended from kitty college, daycare. Like, it started early for me, y'all. People didn't recognize the potential I had. They didn't see it. They, didn't, they just didn't see it. But here's the thing. There, there was a way. And now we act like we can't live without this. It happened to me. I left to go to the store. And I'm in, my, I'm in my truck, and I'm like, man, where's my phone? I didn't have it. I turned around like it was a kid. Like I left something so valuable, I got to get back for it. I'm not saying, listen, this, this has done some great things. But let's be honest. It has also done some very not great things. We have so much here. We have so much right here that can be helpful and also be hurtful. And for the most, most of the time, 
And you have to decide, Lord, is my time on this helpful or hurtful? Because I'm telling you, I don't, I don't see it in my neighborhood. Man, kids don't play outside. That's crazy. And I'm not going to get on a big political, oh, the kids need to go outside. I'm just telling you, I thought it was hilarious that I talked to a, um, a family. They were like, yeah, they did this. We took their phones away. We made them go play outside. And I'm like, that's their punishment. Like, that was, that was what I, that's, that's what we did when things were good. When we were punished, we had to sit in the house. It's opposite now. I mean, that's crazy. But you see what I mean? There could be so much stuff that just takes our attention away from what, it's, from what it should be in. And this is one, and I'm encouraging you. You need to take some time, and you need to, you need to get control of this. And so do I. We all do. We all do. Listen, emails, they'll be there. People can leave a message on there like they can anything else. I've made a decision. I try to take Fridays off. I got a couple calls yesterday that I didn't answer. Because if, if it's a major thing, don't leave, a, don't leave a message or shoot me a text. Hey, something happened. Okay, I'll respond. But we got to be able to say everything is not more important than the main thing. And our relationship with God has to be number one. And we got to take time to be with him. It's funny, Matthew 26, 37 through 41. This is when Jesus is in the garden. He gets Peter, James, and John. He tells them to pray with them. And uh, so he goes. He says, he went a little further about his face to the ground, praying, my father, if it's possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. But I want your will to be done, not mine. So here's Jesus really feeling. He knows what's coming. And he's like, if there's any way this could be taken from me. Then he returned to the disciples and he found them asleep. And he said to Peter, could you watch with me even for an hour? Like, I mean, you're sleeping. Could you not just pray? And he says, keep watch and pray so that you won't give in to temptation. Then he says this, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Listen, it's your flesh is weak when it comes to doing the right thing. And if you allow your flesh to lead you, I'm telling you, you will not be able to stand strong. In the days ahead that we're facing, you will not be able to stand strong if you're basing it on your flesh. Because he said right there, your spirit's willing, your flesh is weak. I'm not saying it would have been, but had they prayed, would they have all deserted Jesus? Just a couple chapters later, Peter was the one that said, I'll never deny you. I'll, oh, I'll die for you. Peter was big, bad Peter. I got you, Jesus. I'm with you. And he had opportunity to pray, and he didn't. He slept. And then when that time comes, he denies, he denies Jesus. Why? Because his flesh is weak. What you say you want to do doesn't mean you're going to do it if you're depending on your flesh. John 3.30 says, it says, he must increase, I must decrease. That's a scripture that we have to look at when it's talking about we, in order for him to increase, then I have to decrease. Think of it as a scale, you know, those old scales that they had, Right? For one to increase, one has to decrease. So if, 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 you want, if you want more of the things of God in your life, you have to decrease the things of you in your life. And you have to detach. You have to disconnect. Now, I've said a lot to kind of prepare you for a few scriptures, but look at Exodus chapter 34. We're going to talk about what happens when, when you fast and you say no to those things. Okay, in Exodus 34... Moses remained on the mountain with the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights. In all that time, he ate no bread, drank no water. And the Lord wrote the terms of the covenant, the Ten Commandments, on the stone of the tablets. When Moses came down to Mount Sinai, carried the two stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant, he wasn't aware that his face had become radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. <clears throat> Listen, for all that time that he had fasted, 
and he prayed it was no longer about Moses. And all of a sudden, God spoke, and God gave him these Ten Commandments that he came down with. And when he came down with, there was this different look to Moses, this radiant around his face because he had been with Jesus. He had been with God. And you could tell. I'm telling you, when you will, when you will disconnect from stuff, and I'm taking it generic, but even at that, this particular time of, of, of food, and really focus in on God, I'm telling you, it changes you. It changes you. Luke chapter 4, 1 through 14, this is where Jesus has been fasting. It says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where he was tempted for the devil, tempted by the devil for 40 days. He ate nothing all that time, became very hungry. Then the devil said to him, and then we'll go through, I won't read all this, but the, the devil tempts him three times. And every time he's tempted, he uses the word, and he, and he doesn't fall prey to any temptation. And I think there's part of that where Jesus was, we talked about this last week, Jesus continually spent time with his father. And then when Jesus, even as a human, Jesus was fully human. He fasted, and he and he and he went. He he came away from the stuff, and he fasted, and he walked in power, and he walked in strength. Acts thirteen, verse two through four. One day these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, and then I love it, it says worshiping the Lord and fasting. Look what happens next. The Holy Spirit said, "Appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work which I've called them." So after more fasting and prayer, these men laid hands on them and sent them on their way. So Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. They went down to the Sea of Seleucia and then sailed for the island of Cyprus. So here, here what happens. They're praying and they're fasting and the Holy Spirit speaks to them. Tells them exactly what to do. Sometimes by, by fasting and not having, you know, going through a, a, a time with, without food. Or going through a time without media, social media. I'm telling you, all of a sudden you find that you're, you're starting to say no to those things that want to pull you. Which means you are saying no to your flesh. And when you say no to your flesh, this is where fasting comes in. It's not just about saying no to your flesh, but saying yes to God. In other words, I'm not just going to not eat. But I'm going to not eat and spend my lunch break spending time with God. Praying or listening to worship music or, or reading the Bible. Whatever, whatever he leads me to do. But I'm going to take the time that my, my, my flesh wants to do this. And I'm going to say, no, instead we're doing this. And it's going to make us stronger and make us better. Acts 14 verse 23 Paul and Barnabas also appointed elders in every church. With prayer and fasting, they turned the elders over to the care of the Lord in whom they had put their trust. Again, even Paul and Barnabas, as they're doing ministry, all part of their decision making has to do with prayer and fasting. Times where they not only prayed, but they, they fasted to really hear from God. And again, it's not that God speaks when you fast. It's that you block out all the other stuff so you can hear them. If everybody's talking, I said, listen, I need everybody to be quiet for a minute because she's trying to say something. And if I can quiet all the other voices, I can focus on the one person who wants to say something or who I want to hear something from. And that's what fasting does. It closes, it shuts all the other voices out to say, I want to hear clearly what the Spirit of God is saying to me and what he wants to do today in my life and through my life. But sometimes I have, to, I have to quiet all these voices. Listen, there's too many voices in our heads right now. And we got to be careful. There's too many. Second Chronicles 20. It says, after this, the army of the Moabites, Ammonites, and some of the Meunites declared war on Jehoshaphat. Messengers came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army from Edom is marching against, against you. From beyond the Dead Sea. They are already at Hezazan Tamar. This was another name for Jedi. 
Jehoshaphat was terrified by this news and begged the Lord for guidance. He also ordered everyone in Judah to begin what? Fasting. He said, Put, stop everything. We got to focus here. We got to get help. So people from all the towns of Judah came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord's help. Now let's go to verse 13. Tomorrow, march out against them. You will find them coming up through the ancient of Ziz at the end of the valley that opens into the wilderness of Jerul. But you will not even need, listen, this is the Lord saying, listen, you will not even need to fight. Take your positions, stand still, watch the Lord's victory. He was with you, O people of Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Go out again against them tomorrow. For the Lord is with you. Then King Jehoshaphat bowed low with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem did the same, worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites from the clans of Kahath and Korah stood to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud shout. Early the next morning, the army of Judah went out to the wilderness of Tekoa in the way of Jehoshaphat, stopped and said, Listen to me, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be able to stand firm. Believe in his prophets, and you will succeed. After consulting the people, the king appointed singers to walk around, to walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord and praising him for his holy splendor. And this is what they sang. Give thanks to the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. And at the very moment they began to sing and give praise, the Lord caused the armies of Ammon Mo Moab and Mount Seir to start fighting amongst themselves. The armies of Moab and Ammon turned against their allies from Mount Seir and killed every one of them. After they had destroyed the army of Seir, they began, att they began attacking each other. So when the army of Judah arrived at the lookout point in the wilderness, all they saw were dead bodies lying on the ground as far as they could see. Not a single one of the enemies had escaped. King Jehoshaphat and his men went out to gather the plunder. They found vast amounts of equipment, clothing, other valuables, more than they could carry. There was so much plunder that it took them three days to collect it all. So here's what happens. At the first sign of trouble, King Jehoshaphat said, let's fast. He called a fast. And as you go through that story, you see that all of a sudden, God began to speak to them. They knew exactly what to do. And God came through for them. And God fought the battle for them. Brought complete chaos to the enemy. And the enemy basically turned on themselves. Can I just tell you that when you are fully focused on God, and you are disconnecting from all the stuff, and all the stuff that tries to grab us and get our attention... When you focus on God, you are going to see God move in ways in your life that you've never seen before. Because now you're, you're looking, you're focused. Because can I just tell you, God has done things for you anyway. And you didn't even know. And we get so caught up. We get so caught up in stuff. We get so caught up in it. But honestly, it's, we're, we're, we're missing we're missing so much because our focus is not where it should be. We have to disconnect from this stuff. We have to. And I'm asking you and I'm challenging you and I'm not doing a corporate thing. Like we're all going to do this. But I'm telling you, I would encourage you this week to make a decision to disconnect. To get off of Facebook or even if it's just a few days, if it's a week, if it's a day, whatever, get off of it. To take one day or one meal. Listen, if, if there's, you know, health things going on, you're supposed to eat, eat. Right? Hear from God on this. Don't just make a decision. Whatever it is, though, do something to get back in the place where you're not, where you're not disconnected in any way. Where you're not connected to the wrong thing. Sometimes we have stuff just spewing out, and we wonder why. We got to stop. We got to, wherever that connection is, we got to find out, and we got to stop. We got to stop it. 
We should be having things flow out of us. Listen, a couple weeks ago, we had a kids event, and we had a water slide out there. And I will, I will tell you, it took a lot of us adults a few days to recover because we thought it would be fun for us to try. And it's not as fun when you're older. But I will say this, when we first got the hose out, um, where we had it hooked up, it, there wasn't much coming out of it. So it took a while for the water slide even to have enough water we could do anything. And then we ended up plugging into a different, a different spigot that, man, it, it came out really good. So what did we do? We wanted the one that was more effective. So we undid, we, we turned the other one. We didn't, the other one wasn't doing it. So the one we put at the top of the slide, we changed the source of it. So it would be, it would be better. So for us as believers, listen, whatever you have coming out of your life, some of it is a result of what you're connected to. And if you don't see stuff coming out of your life that's really producing what you want to produce and what God says you can produce, then you have to look and say, I'm connected to some stuff that's hindering the flow of what God has for me. And I'm not going to connect to that anymore. I'm going to, I'm going to connect straight to the source. So I'm going to un, unhook from this, and I'm going to hook up to this. And it'll change. It'll change. So don't, don't not do something just to say you didn't do it. But I'm saying I'm asking some of you to, to pray about fasting a meal, fasting for a day, and seek God. Pray. Some of you, make a decision. You know, one thing you can do is if just by eliminating an app, you've solved yourself a lot of problems. Because this, it, it, listen, this will try to get your attention even when you make a decision not to. It's going to sit there and buzz around in your pocket until you answer it. And if you don't answer it, it's going to put a little notification up. Hello? You got a text? Or you got a message? Or somebody wants to know this or somebody, you know, whatever. And you have to, you have to make the decision for this time. For this 20 minutes that I'm spending with God, there's, there is a thing on here that says, do not disturb. I'm learning how to use it. I'm learning how to use it. Do not disturb. I am, I am, I am in process. Listen, if I can, if I can spend more time with God, I'm just going to tell you right now. If I stay connected to him, I am going to be an amazing pastor, husband, friend, son, brother, whatever role I'm in, I'll be good at it because he'll lead me and he'll guide me. Me spending all this time trying to be good at all this stuff, if I'm not connected to him, there's no way. So my challenge to you today, disconnect. Disconnect disconnect go one week without talking about the virus go one week without talking about a mask or, or a vaccination as far as your opinion love people if theirs is different let it, let it be different love them spend time with God you know what God will tell you I love those people who wear a mask I love those people who don't I love those people who got the shot I love people who didn't you connect with God, you'll love like that. You'll be less opinionated. And you'll be more focused on what God, what really matters. And God will show you what that is. God will show you. I promise you this, you'll hear from him. You will hear from God if you seek him. He'll speak to you. Because he loves you.